Welcome to session number one of the CAST Community Read. My name is Mike Wakeford, and I'm Interim Executive Director at Muse Winston-Salem. At Muse Winston-Salem, our mission is to connect and enlarge the community through history, storytelling, and informed, balanced perspective that leads to acceptance, understanding, and belonging. And it's with that mission and those goals in mind that I want to thank each of you for being here tonight for the first of three evenings dedicated to a community exploration of Isabel Wilkerson's acclaimed new treatment of race in America, CAST, the origins of our discontents. Major thanks to the co-sponsors of these programs, Wake Forest University, Bookmarks, and the UNC School of the Arts. And, our, and of course, thanks too to all of our special guest commentators from Wake Forest, UNC Greensboro, and North Carolina A&T. It is terrifically exciting to have such a varied group of contributors and participants playing a role in this uh, event or series of events. So let's begin. Um, to those in the audience, um, I want to just offer a very quick uh, Zoom tutorial for anybody new to the technology. First, um, you'll notice that your mics are muted and they're uh, going to stay that way with this many people on the, on the call. Um, we, we figure every, it will be better for, for the event if we, um, if we uh, make background noise go away. Um, and you may want to uh, experiment as the evening progresses with the, in your upper, usually in the upper right, um, you can make a decision about whether you wanna see one person at a time or see everybody. Um, and you can go back and forth, but the speaker view versus gallery view is the way you control that. Um, so um, I'm gonna pass things off now just for a moment to Monique O'Connell. Um, Dr. Monique O'Connell is professor of history and chair of the history department at Wake Forest University, where since 2004, she has taught and researched in the area of medieval and early modern Europe. And I probably need to unmute Monique's uh, microphone now that I'm thinking about it. Yep, here we go, Monique. Thank you, Mike, for unmuting me and uh, <laughs> welcome to everyone. Um, I'm here representing Wake Forest um, and I'd first like to thank um, the office of the Dean of the College, specifically M Dean Michelle Gillespie and Associate Dean Eric Stottlemyre for their help getting the funding for this, specifically for the free books, which went like hotcakes. I just, I know from the numbers that not all of you were able to get one, um, but the fact that we did have some free books to give away was due to the Mellon One grant that supports projects like this, um, which creates connections between the Winston-Salem community and Wake Forest students and faculty, um, and students and faculty from other regional universities for important discussions of social landscapes and racial justice in the Winston-Salem area. And I'm also here on behalf of the history department at Wake Forest. Historians do many things, but among our core skills are two things, reading books, talking about books. And this group does both. So it really plays to our strengths as historians. Um, and we in the history department have also made it a priority to try and engage more with the community as we talk about history. And in the past couple of years, we've been doing this by public talks and events. And as I scroll through the list of the, your little faces here, I recognize some of you from our past talks, um, either at Old Salem or in in our admissions department or from our lifelong learning program. So welcome to all of you. And I really hope that once we can gather in person again, I will be able to say a personal hello to all of you. Um, but one of the things I'm really excited about as we necessarily pivot to this remote event is the possibility it gives everyone to have a voice in the discussion. Rather than just standing up at the end and asking a question of a speaker, we're here to discuss. Um, which makes me really happy because it makes me feel like I'm in a history classroom, which is one of my favorite places to be. And one of the best moments um, in a history classroom, at least for me, is when people have different opinions about the book. That is the moment when I sit up and I, I actually sort of wiggle a little bit because I'm so excited. And I say, tell me why. Um, I'm really curious to know what you think. And I really hope that we'll be able to embody that here tonight. And so I will turn things back to Mike to get things started. Thanks, Monique. Um, indeed, the, the free books were the, uh, were the draw right out of the gate. And um, we are so grateful to Wake Forest um, for 
uh, for that support um, went a long way to kickstarting this event. Um, looking at the numbers, we have over 260 folks in the room right now. Uh, some are two, two per screen, so we're doing great. Um, it is now my great pleasure to introduce Dr. April Ruffin Adams, who will serve as moderator for all three sessions of the CAST Community Read. Uh, Dr. April Ruffin Adams is an instructor in the African American and African Diaspora program at UNC Greensboro, where she's taught since 2016. Her research interests include critical race theory, black feminist theory, and educational equity. She is also, I should add, a member of, of the board of Muse Winston-Salem. So welcome, April, the show is yours. Yep. Oh, I see, I need to ask her to unmute. There we go. Mute myself, there we go. Sorry. Thank you, thank you, Michael. And good evening, everyone, and welcome to the first of these three discussions on the book cast by Pulitzer Prize winning author uh, Isabel Wilkerson. Um, I want to thank Muse Winston-Salem for having the faith in me to moderate these three sessions. And I also want to thank all of the partic participants, particularly tonight, Dr. Barry Trachtenberg. Um, as many of you already know, the book is about caste in the United States. It is a book that Wilkerson wrote after her book, The Warmth of Other Sons, which is a story of historical, um, the historical study of the Great Migration, which occurred from 1950 to 1970, when African Americans, Black people in the South, migrated to the Midwest, West, and Northeast. Of course, the need for these 6 million people to leave the South and go to what we now call these urban areas or cities was caused by the poor economic prospects in the South, the malicious and perpetual discrimination and prejudice they experienced, including lynchings and Jim Crow laws. According to Wilkerson, the need to write the book cast came from her experience writing Warmth of Other Sons when she realized she was writing about Black people in an American caste system, not just racism. Um, she found there to be a hierarchy, and that's what she's describing here. She found that people leaving the South, going to the more urban areas which they were to become, left a shadow, left in a shadow of caste that was similar to what she found in India. However, this book is not about Nazi Germany or about the Indian caste system, it's about what Wilkerson describes as the American caste system, which began in the South with the invention of chattel slavery, which turns humans into property, and the remnants of that which still exists today. So caste, according to Wilkerson, is a better and more precise description of the embedded hierarchy that we continue to live in that promotes separation in the United States. So now I wanna tell you a little bit about the evening. We'll first have a conversation with Dr. Barry Trachtenberg, who we'll, I'll introduce in just a moment. After that, we'll go into Zoom breakout rooms. We hope to make this a true community event by letting you go into breakout rooms with about six people to discuss the book. And we have a few predetermined questions for you. And so um, after you talk about the group, um, talk about the book in your groups and come up with hopefully a few more questions for us to discuss, then we'll um, come back into the big Zoom room for an additional discussion. And our goal is to be through with this in an hour and 15 minutes. We want to be respectful of your time and we wanna keep you engaged so that you keep coming back. Now I'd like to introduce our special guest for the evening, Dr. Barry Trachtenberg. He is an associate professor of history at Wake Forest University, where he is the Michael R. and Deborah K. Rubin Presidential Scholar of Jewish History. He is the author of two books in the 
in uh, the United States and the Holocaust, Race, Refuge, and Remembrance, published in 2018, and the Revolutionary Roots of Modern Yid Yiddish, 1903 to 1917, published in 2008. Since arriving at Wake Forest in 2016, he has been a member of its program um, and Jewish studies and was its initial was its director from 2017 to 2020. He has been a board member of the Wake Forest chapter of every cap campus, a refuge. He serves on the board of scholars for fa of facing history and ourselves and the academic council of Holocaust Educational Foundation of Northwestern University. Welcome Dr. Trachtenberg. And I apologize for fumbling that some. Thank you. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Oh, it's good to see you. Nice to see you too. All right, so let's talk. Let's talk about your impressions of the book cast. I guess we'll we'll start at the beginning. Yeah. Right. We'll start at the beginning. At the beginning. So we know that it isn't a book about the Holocaust. But that she is attempting to bring some um, to bring out the connective tissue between um, Nazi Germany and the Indian caste. And she does that by describing um, some of the research that she's found um, by anthropologists and historians on um, Nazi Germany. And, and one of the things she found particularly interesting that Nazi Germany studied um, the United States American caste system. Um, so let's see, although she didn't focus on it, Let's talk about how she arrived at the caste system that she parallels the Nazi Germany parallel to the American caste system. She said she came to it in um, after the Charlottesville riots. And she noticed there that um, the rioters had both swastikas and um, Confederate flags. Um, do you want to talk about how these two things came together? Sure, um, I can try, you know, um, I'll probably defer to you uh, to some degree as well. That moment when um, the rioters in Charlottesville were, were marching, you know, they were holding those tiki torches, they were yelling, you Jews will not replace us while holding Confederate flags. I think it was a real wake up moment for, for many people. And it just so happened to be at the, at the time when I was uh, writing the conclusion to my book on the US and the Holocaust, which looks at the relationship between those two through the lens uh, of, of race in, in America. And I had to really scrap the whole uh, conclusion of the work um, because I thought it was kind of sort of be a, a rather benign ending to the work, just kind of summing up the arguments I was making a few gestures to what's to come. And then of course this whole election came and everything sort of um, became turned upside down again. Um, and it really brought together in an important way, this conversation between uh, race in America and race how it was played out in Nazi Germany. And it was um, sort of helpful for, for my understanding and there was a lot of scholarship written at the time both questioning um, about the, the actual sort of historical connections between the, these two sort of historical moments or events, but, but also for those of us who, who work and think in the field of Jewish studies about the, the racial position of Jews here in the United States and how it seems to be going a process of, of, of rethinking once again. Um, so, you know, one of we've been talking quite a bit over the last couple of weeks, you and I, about this this work and kind of going back and forth and around a whole set of questions. Um, but I'll say that you know one of the, the the things that I find sort of most helpful about this work is uh, Wilkinson's ability to talk about the microaggressions that so many people of color experience in the United States. 
on a day-to-day -day moment, whether it's the, you know, the experience of being ignored in a, in a restaurant, of uh, being a, a, a assumed to be a bicycle messenger when you're just in the elevator opening your own mail or really being harassed when you're sitting in, in first class in the airport and putting that in, in relationship to and in conversation with the real sort of macro issues of systematic racism in the United States and looking at how it's, it's not something that's only experienced on an individual day-to-day -day basis, but really in this, this really sort of deep structural way where it, it happens in terms of voter suppression, it happens in terms of economic injustice and in housing discrimination and all of these different forms and these long roots. And, um, and it's really helpful for me to be thinking about that in terms of the position of Jews in Germany as well. Um, so I'll leave it at, at there. Um, although I've, you know, I've got a lot I wanted to talk about with this work, so I'll pause there. Well, one of the things that I was thinking about is, yeah, she does talk about these, um, what you call the, what we call microaggressions as um, the working of caste, how she sees it. She calls um, caste the bones and race the skin, right? And um, when she talks about in the book, um, her stories of going in the going in the uh, the airport and the 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 paperweight or the the Brahmin mm -hmm. the Dalit statue being um, examined and yeah. and the stories all of these things that happened post two thousand sixteen mm -hmm. right um, how do you see those connections with the the issues of caste how do you see that reflecting caste in american society yeah i mean she has this really beautiful passage and it's on the the middle of page 70 and it's the the one sort of quote i wanted to encourage people to sort of look at um, right. together and it speaks directly to this point so i'm glad you know i, I found it but it's in uh, sort of the dead center of page 70 where she says caste is insidious Mm -hmm. and therefore powerful because it's not hatred. It's not necessarily personal. Mm -hmm. It's the worn grooves of comforting routines and unthinking expectations, patterns of a social order that have been placed for so long that it looks like the natural order of things. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, I, I think that says so much, and, and this is, is really one of the, the, the great strengths of the work. Um, whether or not we accept the category of caste, and that's something I'd really like mm -hmm. to kind of talk through with you a bit, um, whether it makes sense to talk about it in terms of America and, or Nazi Germany. Um, but that description kind of knocked me off my feet a little bit. On the one hand, it's completely obvious and utterly unsurprising. And at the same time, it's immensely powerful, right? Because it just talks about how that caste is not an aberration in our society, mm -hmm. sort of just a, a correction that we can make, you know, either by turning this way or turning that way, or if you want to use another metaphor, just by cutting it out. Mm -hmm. But it is society, right? It's the, it is the world that we inhabit. And so to undo that work is, is going to require a profound transformation that's much more so than um, choosing a, a presidential candidate or passing, you know, civil rights legislation. It's, it's going to go much, much deeper than that. Um, yeah. Now, certainly, when you think about similarities between caste, um, how she terms caste in the American system, and um, thinking about Germany, there are a lot of differences. Like, caste, the American caste system as she defines it, begins with the inception of the country prior to even right when when the the first Africans arrive on these shores there begins to be this delineation between them and the indentured servants the white indentured servants so we start immediately almost having a distinction between the type of work that they were doing and I guess um, almost the expectations Germany is behind on the ball on that one right yeah, um, I, I guess. I don't know if it's behind the ball or ahead of the ball, depending. Yeah. Um, well, I don't know, because <laughs> well, the pocket, but, since, yeah. they, since they were trying to 
implement this system sure. after everything was started. Yeah, I mean, this, this is the this is the 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 difficulty of comparisons, right? I mean, we can see the sort of the the benefits of comparisons in that there's there are direct links between how Nazism was constructed and shaped and the experience of racism in the United States, you know, um, and I'm happy to, to talk through those. And she points to some the the differences, though, between the two systems are really quite profound. Mm -hmm. Right. So, um, you know, at the moment when Germany becomes a state in 1871, actually Jews are emancipated. You know, it's a, it's a liberal moment when the, the various sort of principalities and duchies all come together and create a, a, a centralized German state. At that moment, Jews become full citizens. And all anti-Jewish measures that had been on the books dating back to medieval times, all of that's erased. Mm -hmm. And so it's actually this great kind of moment of, of opportunity and the fulfillment of a nearly century long vision of many Jews in Germany. And it's, you know, it's two full generations later that Hitler comes and undoes that process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, the, the comparisons kind of break down, I think, fairly quickly. Right. Yeah. You know, what we have to realize is that the experience of slavery alone in the United States was what, like 240 years, right? 250, so 250 <laughs> right? And then the period of Jim Crow. The Nazi period is 12 years. It is an immensely brutal, I think, unparalleled 12 years in our history. I'm certainly not going to diminish it as a scholar of the Holocaust. But we also, you know, if we're looking at comparisons, we need to actually look at comparisons, you know. Um, and what, one of my concerns uh, with the work is it's not clear to me why the discussion of Nazism at all, to be honest. Uh, it, it's, you know, what the Nazis put in place is not a caste system, you know, because mm -hmm. as she describes, you know, it's in some of the pillars and it's um, certainly deep within her description of both India and the United States is that the creation of a class of a caste system is the creation of a sort of a permanent underclass right. that is going to serve the majority caste or, or class system, right? Mm -hmm. um, but of course, that wasn't the, the place of Jews within Nazi society. You know, if we think of those 12 years, Really, the first six to seven years of the Nazi regime, Hitler comes into power in 33. What they're doing with the Jews is they're trying to eliminate them from the, the public sphere, meaning that Jews lose their job, they lose their citizenship, they, they, they lose their housing rights, they, they lose everything. And the goal is to push them out, right. right? And so, what you have actually is that, you know, within a year or two in World War II, it's close to 90% of Jews have left Germany at this point. Mm -hmm. If they've gone elsewhere, mostly into Europe, where many of them then are murdered in the Holocaust. But once the war starts in 1939, and certainly after a couple of years, the program is fully an extermination. Mm -hmm. one, mm -hmm. Right. The goal is to fully eliminate the presence of Jews, not just in Germany, not just in Europe, but but ultimately anywhere in the world. Right. So it's not to maintain them as a permanent mm -hmm. underclass that would serve. That was actually the position of Slavs sort of in the Nazi mindset, Slavic right. peoples, mm -hmm. Poles and, and Russians. But Jews were, to, Jews were seen as a competing group who could never be fully assimilated or brought into the German nation without permanently injuring it. Right. right? And, and so, yeah, so it's, it's not clear to me, you know, why the inclusion uh, of, of the Holocaust and, and Nazi Germany in this, um, other than perhaps to talk about some of the parallels that, that do exist for, in, in, in different ways. Well, let's talk about some of the ones that you see that may not be necessarily in the book. Let's talk about some of those. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, she does uh, develop this briefly um, in the work, but you know, there are very clear discussions and meetings and conversations between, for example, eugenicists in the United States and eugenicists in Germany long before the Nazi regime. This goes back to the, the 1890s um, or the first decade uh, of the 20th century, where you have eugenicists who are in clear conversation with one another, thinking about ways to make policy with one another. Now, the way that that manifests itself in Germany is with the creation of this like category of people who using the, the German term, it's called Lebensunwertes Leben, which means life that's unworthy of life. Mm. 
right? So there's discussions around, are there people whose lives are not worth living? Meaning their lives do not serve the state. They don't serve the, the biological health of the German nation. Initially, this doesn't really refer to Jews. It refers to people who are perceived to be disabled. Mm -hmm. It re refers to the poor. It refers to people with congenital illnesses. It refers to people who seem to have chronic uh, engagements with you know, law enforcement. So the poor, the, the German underclass. It's only later, really, that the Nazis then take this idea and begin applying it to Jews, also to people who are perceived to be disabled, to Roma and Sinti, who we call gypsies often into some other groups as well. Um, but of course, those ideas also take root here in the United States, right? So in the United States in the 1900s, 1910s, 20s, you have things like uh, fitter family contests, right? So think about at the county fair, there would be the, these contests, see like which families were the most fit, sort of eugenically speaking, who had you know, the bluest eyes and the blondest hairs and the squarest face, like clearly I would not win this contest. Um, but these are the kind of discussions that go on, but then there's these very insidious ways, right? So it's not only promoting sort of good eugenic health, it's about eliminating those who are deemed to be unhealthy for the society, right? So this leads to, you know, the, the mass sterilization of hundreds of thousands of people in the United States, a program that continued until at least the 1970s here in North Carolina, right? Mm -hmm. We should remember, and which seems to have been happening very recently with many uh, Mexican refugees trying to come into the United States in the last couple of years. Um, so these, these ideas haven't gone away. But what we can see is like that's a point at which these, these two um, major world powers of Germany and, and the United States, there's these real conversations that are going on. And those conversations only end, they don't end with the creation of the Nazi regime. They only end when Germany begins a program of murdering disabled children in the opening days of the war, when the US is still not in it, right? The US is neutral for the first two years of the war. It's only then, really in late 39, early 1940, do those meetings break off, right? So there are these real powerful connections to make. I'm just not sure that they're made necessarily in service of caste or mm -hmm. certain service of, of uh, Wilkinson's argument. Well, I can see, you know, like you said, I can see that if you individualize the the concepts, eugenics, um, that was the the, the race-based science, of course, that came after Reconstruction, because now after we eliminate slavery, now we have to um, create laws that move right up to the point of slavery without actually being it, which then becomes more insidious, right? Yeah. More gruesome. And then we need the science to back up the need yeah. for this dehumanization, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, I can see that in the increments and I can see how that certainly would be used. I think she was really just, um, from my reading of the book, she yeah. seemed really just amazed that ultimately, Jews um, in Germany were seeing, um, I guess their humanity was um, seen differently than the humanity of black people in, in this country. So what I'm trying to say is the one drop rule, that, that's one of the things that, that, that amazed her, that, yeah. that, you know, that even having one drop, so they didn't want to remove the, the Aryans, Right. Yeah. I mean, one of the, the, di the difficulties, um, you know, that the Nazis were faced with was that they, they had to define who was a Jew, right? And so one of the questions I often ask my students is, why did Jews force, or why did uh, Germany force Jews to wear yellow stars on, on their clothes? It's like, well, that's because they couldn't tell who was a Jew and who wasn't, right? Because you have this very long period in uh, European history generally where, where many Jews, especially in Western and Central Europe, are trying to integrate themselves into the larger society and have their Judaism be expressed purely in, in religious forms, right? And so their outward appearance looked very much like that of the people around them. And indeed, the level of intermarriage in Germany between uh, uh, Jews and non-Jews in Germany in the 1920s was something like 24, 25%. Mm -hmm. So it's really, really very high. So there's actually this 
great level of integration that exists. But you know, with the 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 depression that you know that hits in 2930, the, the, this new panic, you know, this Nazi party comes into power, and it's a minority. It comes in under a, a minority vote, and they, the Nazis never gain a majority election uh, results in any fair election, and yet they're able to seize power and take power very very controlly, and eventually kind of convince the rest of society to buy into it in one way or another. And this is actually where her conversations in some ways about caste are quite useful because you know, what Hitler is able to do in some ways is to make the case that often gets made about sort of whites in America that to give Jews rights means to take them away from Germans, right? Rights begin to be thought of in a way as property, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That they're material, right? Just how slaves were you know, a form of property. Rights in America become a form of property. Right, and this is something that the Nazis really, I think, take over. Maybe not directly, but you know, they certainly share this. And the belief is, if you expand rights to one group, well, then you've taken them away for another. And so, immediately after 1871, when when Jews in Germany are emancipated, you have anti-Semitic political parties that form to try to strip that away. Right, and so just as you see here in the United States, as Wilkerson says after the 64 Civil Rights Act was passed, never has a Democratic president won a white majority vote, including with Joe Biden. Right, right, right. right. see that, right? Because people think, right. we, well, we, we're going to give freedom to African-Americans. Well, I'm going to lose out somehow. But of course, we know rights don't work that way, right? They're not limited. They don't need to be limited in that way. We can think about them as we like think of love, right? We, it's like ever expansive. Right? So. Barry, yeah. we're yeah. going to talk about whiteness as property yeah. later. Okay. <laughs> and we're going to work into the uh, breakout rooms and Great. I am for, for a few minutes and I'm going to turn this back to Michael. Okay. Thanks, April. Thanks, Barry. That was got us off to a, a great start. So um, folks, let me talk at you for, for a second. In, um, in just a moment, you are going to be possibly for the first time in your lives sucked into a breakout room vortex. Um, so let me just prepare you for that, for that journey. With the press of a button, um, each of you is going to be moved to one of several dozen randomly created rooms where you'll find yourself with a handful of other participants, probably seven or eight folks. Um, and when you arrive there, we would like to, um, our, our primary reason for sending you there is so that you have a chance to uh, introduce yourself and build at least a little bit of a, of a community inside of this um, big, uh, big Zoom, uh, Zoom meeting. Um, but when you arrive there, in addition to um, quickly introducing yourselves to each other, we'd like for you to have a short focused uh, discussion on a couple prompts. And I'm about to, in the chat bar, I am about to uh, put a uh, put a, uh, a set of uh, just a little blurb of text right there, um, and I'm going to hit enter now. And the the really gifted among you might cop might uh, right now do a copy uh, of what I just posted in the chat bar because you'll see it has sort of the agenda for what we'd like you to do um, for the 15 minutes that you spend in. Uh, the breakout room with your new friends. When you get there, um, when I when I click the button in a, in a second, um, it'll take a few moments for the for the uh, machinery to send you all uh, all to the right place. But but eventually you'll you'll find yourself there with a few others. Um, when you when you are there, there'll probably be seven or eight of you. Um, introduce yourselves to each other. Um, if you want to add a word about what brings you here tonight, and you know what what uh, kind of what led you to. Uh, to take interest in this event, feel free to do that. And then you'll see that there's a couple of questions we'd like you to focus on. One, um, there for those of you, and please don't don't worry if you haven't if you haven't read far enough in the book. This isn't school. There's not going to be a test, and we're all friends already. So, um, but but we will point out that um, early in the book, as some of you know, um, Wilkerson puts a, a wonderful metaphor to work. It's the metaphor of America as an old house. Um, and she, she introduces it early in the book on pages 15 uh, through 17. So you can go and look at it together if you want. Um, and maybe one of you will even volunteer to read a couple of paragraphs of it out aloud. Um, and we, we ask that you, you have a conversation about how that metaphor works for you and if it does work for you and how it does or doesn't resonate with you. So, um, so share a bit uh, on that question. Then uh, move on to the question about 
um, the eight pillars of caste. As you know, in part three of the book, which takes you up through about halfway through the second hundred pages, um, Wilkerson outlines um, in a stepwise uh, way eight, what she calls the eight pillars of caste. Um, take a look at that. And, and if the spirit moves, you have a share a bit with each other about, um, about which of those pillars of caste perhaps spoke to you the loudest, um, you know, sort of fired the synapses in a particular way. Um, let each other, uh, let, let everyone share um, their thoughts about those pillars of caste. Um, and then our, our final request is that, um, that you take a minute as, or just as you go, um, be thinking about a question or two that you can come back to the main Zoom room um, and share with us in the, in the chat bar. And that um, a couple of us who will monitor those questions will pass on to, uh, to April uh, for, and, and possibly uh, with an eye on having those questions asked and, um, and, and talked about uh, in the time we have remaining. So uh, again, if you see in the chat bar what I just posted and want to copy that, you can carry it with you into your, Zoom, your uh, breakout room and then paste it in the chat bar uh, when you arrive there and you can use it as a reference. Hopefully one or two of the folks from uh, uh, heading into each, each breakout room will have done that. I will also put broadcast it into the breakout room in a moment. Um, at, after, at 15 minutes, uh, you will get, uh, or at 14 minutes, you'll get a warning that I'm pulling you back in 60 seconds. Um, you will be pulled back automatically so you don't have to do anything. Um, and then we will continue the conversation. The bad news is it, when you do generate questions for, for April, um, you don't put them in the chat bar in your breakout room because I won't be able to see those. So carry them with you uh, back to the main room. And when you arrive back here, uh, hopefully one or two of, uh, folks in each room will, will take responsibility for that. And then you can post them in the chat, in the chat bar here and I, will, and I and a colleague will see them and, and, uh, and look through them. So um, with that said, and I, oh, just a quick word to, the, to April and Barry and a couple others uh, of the organizers on this. I have not figured out how to prevent us from being sucked into the breakout room vortex. So when you arrive, I know you want to take a, take a breath. Uh, so feel free to back right out of that room as soon as you uh, arrive in it. Okay. So with that, I am going to uh, click the magic, the magic button and send you on your way right here. Looks like we may have done it. All right. I, oh, I'm already I'm already uh, seeing seeing regrets that the conversation was too short. So I, I so I apologize. Um, and no apologies, no apologies. Um, folks are apologizing for not having gotten far enough in the agenda. Again, nobody's being graded here. There'll be time for there'll be time for everything. So um, welcome back, folks. I hope that was um, I hope that was a, an enjoyable chance to um, to sort of meet some folks and, and start a conversation. I'm going to turn it back to um, uh, back to April uh, in a, in a moment. But um, let me just again encourage you to now um, start. Um, if you did come back with questions uh, or, or or thoughts um, from your conversations that you'd like um, you'd like to share, go ahead and put them in the chat bar. Uh, my colleague Alana and I will get them, and we will pass them on uh, to uh, to April and Barry uh, on your behalf. Okay. So uh, April, welcome back. Oh, I probably need to unmute April. There we go, there we go. All right, thank you, Michael. All right, Barry? Yeah. All okay. right, let's talk. So uh, one of the things that we just talked about a little bit was the eight pillars. So would you like to quickly go over the eight pillars as you see them and how that fits into caste and how some of it may even relate to Nazi Germany or just yeah, the, absolutely. the merits of the eight pillars. Yeah, for sure. So for uh, those of you with the copies of the book, this is part three of the work. And I find it helpful just to look at the, pay the table of contents, um, mm -hmm. which is on Roman numeral 12, XII, that's helpful, uh, where they're just sort of listed there. And she talked about these these as the eight pillar of caste, and you know 
one of the things I was thinking of, you know, is to what extent does this apply to the case of Nazi Germany? And, and it actually does, you know, to, to uh, quite, a, quite a bit. Um, you know, the, the first piece that she talked about is that of divine will and the laws of nature. And I'm not going to go through all of these because it would take the rest of our time. But what's interesting is that what you have with, with all of these different systems is sort of a, 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 an ancestral claim, right, mm -hmm. that, that gets made, whether it's sort of the, the white Americans kind of appropriation, from my point of view, of the Old Testament, and, and using this as kind of the, the, the foundation for racial stratification, or as she, you know, she, she talks about ancient um, uh, texts from, from the Hindu religion as sort of, uh, insisting upon the, this, this caste system. Um, and then of course the, the Nazi uh, Germans also you know, created, created their own myth of the Aryan as this super pure race that, um, was uh, the, 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 you know, the dominant people in, in ancient times. And then because of this per pernicious Jewish influence had, be, had been uh, sort of degenerated over the centuries and needed to be restored, you know, so the great Teutonic might. And, and so there's just, it's just sort of this full on kind of manipulation of the past. But as you said before, this is the way that sort of science serves for eugenics, right? It's, it's a way to uh, provide a foundation or a substance to practices that, and beliefs that are already there. Right. Right. And so it's not as if a bunch of scientists sat around and you know, they came up with eugenics. You know, it comes as a way to justify what's already happening and then kind of gives people a pass in some ways. Well, well if it's science or if it's the Bible or if it's, uh, you know, it's what our traditions tell us, well, then it's a way to excuse ourselves from having to sort of really critique the, the, the role that we're playing in these oppressive systems. Right? And, and what's so, so interesting too, I think what you find certainly in the, and, and you know this far more than I do, but that these texts also become sources of resistance. This is something that she doesn't really talk about. But of course, as you know, African-Americans take on or have Christianity imposed upon them, that then becomes a means of resistance to that caste system. Right, so it's really quite powerful that the you know the 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 kind of the permeability malleability of these texts, right? They can be used to justify the oppression, but also they can be the the path of resistance to it. One of those things um, that I have really struggled with, and when I have to explain it to my students um, about how slaves could take on the religion of the slave master, yeah, and the they don't understand how could this happen well of course there was you know the maintaining of their own personal indigenous you know uh, religions um the islamic faith and their indigenous religions and the combination of that and how they could really you know sort of meld that with christianity in some meaningful ways and um but then I often think about the difference between liberation, um, that, that the slaves were able to latch on to Moses, let my people go, mm -hmm. right? Um, th that they were really able to get to that, but that the, the slave masters with their divine will, their, um, uh, the, the, uh, I don't even know. I'm in my mind. I'm thinking manifest destiny. Almost this, you know, <laughs> you know that they, that they belong. That they are the rulers. They're the Brahmins in her to to, to use yeah. her terminology, right? Yeah. And they are the holy ones. And that is the thing that I mean. I even struggle with personally when I think about how can we all go to church and listen to uh, a Christian message, be Christian, and how can we all experience it differently? Like the religion of the slaveholders, but it's not the religion of the slaveholders that the, that the slaves are actually, you know, embodying, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Reverend Barber doesn't call it um, Christianity. He calls it this uh, religious heresy, a religious nationalism, right? Yeah. yeah that absolutely. when um, they say God bless America, they really mean God bless America. And that's that. Yeah, exactly. It ends right there, right? And I think what they f forget about, um, and this is why I sort of work, teach with my students, is 
the, 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 the power and the universality that's available within Christianity, right? I mean, this, right. Is, this comes up obviously in the field of Jewish studies a lot. And I often talk with my students about what the, the, the meaning of Catholicism is. And I always ask my students, how many Catholics are in the room? And a few raise their hands. I was like, what does Catholic mean? And very few of them know that, you know, it, it means the term universal, right? And so there's this universal message that mm -hmm. comes out of Christianity. Mm -hmm. um, but what we also see in, in, in the Jewish case in Europe, that with these different universals that come out, you know, so initially it's Catholicism, right? Later you have it like with the, the, uh, the, the French uh, Revolution and the, these, the ideas of the Enlightenment. Later you see it with Marxism, that these universal I I ideologies that emerge don't allow for dissidence. Right, mm -hmm. you, you only can exist kind of within that system because it's a universal message and it has to be perfect. And if people who stand outside of it, they exist as a critique and they make a universal message limited mm -hmm. by definition of not encompassing everyone. And so this is where you see that the position of Jews in Europe begins to be increasingly marginalized as Christianity becomes more and more dominant. The fact that Jews don't accept that message in large numbers becomes a reason to isolate them, to marginalize them, to relegate them to certain areas of society. And when religion for overall kind of wanes in terms of its influence in the more modern age, what we see is anti-Jewish hatred doesn't go away. It just takes on these different secular forms. Right. And so it's, it's, a, it's a different trajectory, right? It's a different trajectory. But what we can see is that, that Christianity can be both this tool of oppression and this tool of liberation and these these super interesting ways here right that's right but yeah. and, and what you just described about um jewish uh, what did you say jewish um religion yeah, being the, sort of outside of christianity right, right. Yeah. but also that the 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 discrimination that was felt yeah. Right. Didn't go away that it morphed into something else. That is something that definitely happened in the United States. Right. Yeah, I think so. I right. absolutely think so. You know, because I mean, we don't you know, I, I don't know what happens in church on, on a Sunday. That's not where I, I spend my time. Um, but I'm guessing that, you know, there's not a lot of talk about the, the differences of the races anymore. Right. That's not part of the gospel that's being taught any longer in church, even though it still, I think, remains the most segregated hour in the United States. Um, but those ideas are still really present, right? They manifest themselves in, in all different forms. Now, I know you're getting a bunch of questions from yeah. folks, so I'm really, I know we could talk about seven more pillars, but I'm also really interested in, in what um, the topics folks want to raise. Right. So one one group wanted to know about, they said our group was very interested in the revelation that Nazis looked to the United States system when coming up with their strategies. Can Dr. Trachtenberg elaborate on that and tell us more about what the Nazis emulated from Americans? This was new information for us. Yeah. So there's this very good book that um, Isabel Wilkerson talks about in her work, it's by James Q. Whitman, I think, called Hitler's American Model. And it came out, um, unfortunately, right before my book did. Um, and so I didn't get the benefit of it. And, you know, people look more to that book than mine, but that's okay. Um, it's a really good book. I teach it. I teach it in my own classes. Um, and what he talks about are um, how early into the, the Nazi regime, right? So the Nazis come into power in 1933. And they're looking for a legal justification to separate Jews out of German society. And the most natural example that exists for them anywhere in the world is here in the United States, in the American South. And so um, German lawyers are sort of drafted into service and they come to the United States and they study American legal code to figure out what can be made applicable to German society. And what's interesting and what, this is one of the, the places where I think Wilkerson gets it wrong. And um, unfortunately she gets a lot about Germany and the Holocaust wrong in, in the work um, is that the, the attorneys mostly realized that the model wasn't going to work, right. right? And so it was helpful for sort of the first stage because they wanted to separate Jews out from society but they weren't interested in creating a separate Jewish society, a separate Jewish sphere for Jews to, to, uh, to work within. You know, they, they weren't about creating Jewish water fountains and they weren't about creating Jewish 
park benches and Jewish uh, you know, entrances to shops and grocery stores, they wanted the Jews gone, right? And so they realized that that wasn't going to work. Same too with their, their definitions of what comprises a Jew within German law. So they didn't use the one drop rule because then, you know, half of Germany might have disappeared at that point because they couldn't trace things back. So what they did was they came up with um, this very, very sort of silly in a way, if you think about it, definition where, so they're thinking of Jews as a race, but what they do is they say, um, everyone needs to go back to what their grandparents believed. And if two grandparents were members of the Jewish faith, meaning they were registered with sort of the Jewish religious community, well, then that made a person Jewish. But then they had all of these kind of qualifications. And so if you had one Jewish grandparent or three Jewish grandparents, and, but you had served in the military or you had converted out of Judaism or you had married someone who is non-Jew, there were all these different dispensations. So that even by February, 1945, so in the last months of the war, there are still Jews living legally in Germany. They still aren't able to make Germany completely free of Jews. They're living under very oppressed conditions. They're living in segregated housing. They're doing their slave labor, but they're still within Germany itself mm -hmm. because of that tight level of integration that exists. And there were just some people that they just didn't quite feel like they could expel without raising the ire of the larger society. It's one. It's interesting. Um, one of my mentors worse, once told me that to know what you want to do, you have to first know what you don't want to do, mm. and that's sort of how they use the American yeah. model. Yep, yep, they yep. they looked at yep. it and they said, "Well, this is something that we can't do, and we won't do, and you know we won't go this far, but we can do this." So they use that model and then develop their own. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. But they did a lot of research. They did a lot of research. Yeah, and we right. have to remember, you know, the U.S. doesn't enter the war, so it's not enemies with Germany mm -hmm. until very late 1941, right after Pearl Harbor, which means there's diplomatic relations, there's conversations, there's exchanges, there's tourism going back and forth for, you know, nine, eight years or so of the 12 years of the Nazi period. Um, Barry, they have, I have two questions kind of together. It says this book documented history that many of us had not known before. How do we even begin to get to the truth of history, um, of American history, especially children when we can't agree on any, and on any textbooks anymore? And another question that just happened to be from my mother says, how do we tell the history accurately? And many don't know history. So it's, it, these two things are sort of together. Right. So, yeah, but and let's start with your mothers out of respect. Um, <laughs> well, you know, so this is one of my critiques of the work, right? So um, Wilkerson talks about at the, the very opening vignette is the man in the crowd, right? Right. So it's about this figure who stands like this right. when everyone else is giving the, the Hitler salute, which I will not do, right. um, at a, a German shipyard, right? So, and, you've, and it's a fascinating picture. I use it on the, uh, the cover of my syllabus for a class I teach uh, uh, very often. I'm teaching it this semester. And uh, what you see in that picture are Germans of all social classes, workers, businessmen, soldiers, all of them giving the Hitler salute, except for this one guy. And so in the work, um, in uh, Wilkerson's work, she talks about this figure and says, um, she, she names him as August Lahnmesser and she tells the story that um, he was a member of the Nazi party and then fell in love with a Jewish woman and then left the party. So like love, sort of love conquers all in some ways sort of story. And she talks about this with this very, very sort of clear sense, like this is what happened. But the truth is, it's a big debate whether this guy is August Lahnmesser or this other guy named Gustav Wegert. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just not clear. And there are two different camps, mostly the descendants of these two figures. They're saying, it's my guy. No, it's my guy. It's like that famous kiss scene, you know, in Times Square on World War II. Like, you know, I'm the one kissing, you know, it's me, it's me, right? So there's different people are claiming this. And the truth is that like, it very well may be this other figure. And if so, it's a very different story because Gustav Wegert was deeply Christian and rejected Nazism from the very beginning. He didn't have a, 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 a sort of a, a, a turnabout in his perspective and his understanding, right? And so the point of that is, is that like 
history is murky, right? Often we just don't know. Our sources are inadequate. Our sources disappear. Our sources uh, reveal themselves over time. We, we turn the page of history sort of over and over again, and we just kind of seek, you know, there's never going to be a textbook that's definitive, even though some of us, you know, do try to write those, but there, you know, we know they're going to be overturned. We know they're going to be revised because it's just a process of questioning, questioning, questioning. And what we need to do, and I think one of the, the, the strengths of this book is, is it allows us to see a history that maybe we're familiar with, but with a new way of thinking about it, right? And so whether or not we agree with every point that she's making or some of her, her larger claims, right, it gets us talking about this, right? And this is what's so valuable. I think though the struggle is in, in this moment that we have so many places in, our, I guess, our national, international discourse where you hear one thing and from one place and then you hear something else in another. Um, it may have been a comedian that I heard say, maybe even it was Dave, maybe Dave Chappelle. I, I, I could be, you know, misquoting, but one of the things that, you know, the comedian said is that, you know, when one person watched the news and we heard it, we heard Walter Cronkite say it, then we all knew that this was the news. This is what happened. But now we don't see the, the news, the same news. We don't, we don't get all the same facts in the same way. And, you know, we're not reading the same books and the, the intent behind some of the books, right? Yeah. You know, um, I always tell that to my students when they ask me, why aren't they being taught African-American history in their U.S. history class? Because I begin my class with this is a U.S. history class. Then we're just we're just changing the perspective mm -hmm. to include how black people have always been a part of this country. But that was left out yeah. of yeah. your history book. Yeah. I mean, April, this is the struggle, right? This is this is the work that we do. This is why you do your work, and this is why I do my work, right? This is why we have these community discussions. This is why we mm -hmm. assign the the things we have. You know, you, you think like so. I have a kid in, in the public school system, and just last just in the last year, right, the school system decided not to make African American history a mandated part of the curriculum. You know, right um, against the objections of, of hundreds and hundreds of parents and, and, and certainly more than that in terms of the students themselves. Uh, you know, so we just have to keep pushing and pushing and pushing like this. This is just the work that we have to do. I mean, I don't know if the, the age of Walker's Cronkite, you know, I heard that opening that monologue of Dave Chappelle's too. Um, it is Dave uh, Chappelle. Yeah, it was Dave Chappelle, yeah. Okay, good. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure that we wanna go back to that model because that meant there was just only sort of one funnel of information, um, but we have to be teaching, you know, everyone how to have a critical lens, right? And to not just see the things and if they see it over and over again to just accept it, right? We have to teach people, and this is why I teach my students in the, my class on totalitarianism, like we have to figure out how do we become either August Lahn Messer or Gustav Wegert and be the person who sits there kind of critically while everyone else is cheering along. Like, how do you do that? Like, I don't know, but we just keep trying. We just keep hitting it again and again. Like that is just, that's the work, right? I just think it's interesting though, Barry, because, you know, we want to teach critical thinking to a point, you know, we want to <laughs> teach yeah, it to sure. a point, right? Yeah. We want you to, to, to think critically about things unless it's going to be uncomfortable for us. And that's one of those things that I think we really live with in the United States is this, yeah. you know, we don't like to be uncomfortable, which is why we don't talk about slavery and all of its history and how it really is a part. Yeah. I, you know, I recently had a, a conversation with someone and we were talking about, you know, the importance of having these conversations and the person said, oh, you know, I know, I know, all white men are bad, white men are evil, we're the problem, we're the cause of the all the problems in the world. And, you know, we've heard that story. Yeah. So where is critical thinking taking place in that? You know what, and I, I hate to do it, Barry, but we have to move on and I need to throw uh, it. 
I need to throw it to Michael. And then we have one more question. Okay. Great. Well, th thanks, y'all. And and uh, um, there have been so many great great questions um, uh, coming into the to the sidebar. And believe me, we we'll we will keep a record of these. And this is the beauty of having two more. Um, two more uh, events in this series. Um, I think uh, a lot of these questions won't grow old, and we will, um, and we will try to try to get some answers um, for some of these. I want to just do a, a quick screen share, folks, while I make one one little announcement first. Um, just want to give a shout out to the next two um, two events in this in this series. Uh, December second, uh, session number two, with Race Raman. Um, another associate professor of history at Wake Forest University. And then you see session number three on December 9th. So uh, please have those on your calendar and, um, and plan to come back and plan to um, let us, uh, and plan to share uh, news of these next two sessions with, uh, with friends and family. Um, I wanna just mention that uh, my colleague Alana is, I think, um, as I speak, gonna put a link in the, um, in the sidebar if, uh, we are obviously pleased as punch to be offering these events uh, free of charge and we'll continue to. Um, if the spirit moves you though now or later to uh, make a donation to Muse Winston-Salem to help support us in um, continuing this kind of programming, we would, uh, we would greatly appreciate it. So thank you in advance for, um, for anyone who uh, chooses to, uh, to make a gift. Um, I want to just thank all of y'all for, um, for for being here. We're not done yet. I'm gonna uh, gonna uh, push it right back to, to April for uh, a last a last question or two, and uh, and then she will wrap it up and and say good night, and then we'll just start looking forward to seeing you on December second. So April, take it away. Okay. All right. So Barry, one of the things that we really wanted to talk about was the the memorial situation um, in in Germany, the how Germany has handled their history with um, with the with their legacy of yeah. um, uh, the, the 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 grotesque legacy of the Holocaust and Nazism, and we talk about how you know you can see a definite contrast between um, how the Nazis handled. Uh, their memorials, their monuments, and even reparations, and how we've handled that here in the United States. So I like. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, the 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 two histories here are are of course very very different, right? The Nazi period was sort of defined. There was a you know a beginning, a middle, and an end, and it ended in defeat, and it, it was a very clear ending and. Mm -hmm. Almost immediately, there, there's talks of, of, of reparations, and Germany pays out billions to Jewish communities worldwide, not only in the newly created state of Israel, but in local Jewish communities all, all around the world. Um, and they continue to do that really for decades. This is West Germany, obviously, not, not uh, East Germany, which is sort of a different story. But very, very soon, you know, there's a series of trials, right? There's the Nuremberg trials that happened immediately after the war. There's trials of major Nazi figures. All of these just keep the crimes of Nazism in the news. And then, of course, you have it makes its way into popular culture really quickly. Think of the Diary of Anne Frank, for example, which is you know a, a bestseller in the years right after the Holocaust. Think it's a Broadway play, it's a Hollywood movie, and so on. So people are talking about this, and it's clear that this is a terrible injustice, a terrible crime. And very soon there's this, these widespread memorials that emerge and they're still going. And this is one of the things that Wilkerson does really well is talking about this. And in, in 2019, I brought a group of Wake Forest students who had been studying me all year to, to Europe. And we spent quite a bit of time in Germany. And the motivating question I wanted them to, to contend with in which we were thinking through is, what are the ways that different nations remember these moments in their past? And we were in Poland, we were in the Czech Republic, and then we were in Germany. And the real question was though, so then what do we take back with us to the United States? Like, mm -hmm. why don't we have things like those stumbling stones, the Stolperstein that Wilkerson talks about, you know, in front of people's homes, like here, you know, slaves were, 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 were held, right? And with their names, like think of my own university. So the weeks before we left on our trip, you know, people at the university discovered again that much of the, the original funding of the university came from the sale of enslaved people, right? 
and we have their names, but we don't have buildings with these people's names on them. We don't have monuments to these people's names on them. We know that the, the, the city of Winston-Salem was deeply rooted in, in slavery, but we don't have these monuments. We don't have these memorials here. It was only last year that a monument to the Confederacy came down here in, 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 in Winston-Salem, right? This, this short-lived tyrannical slaveholding regime. Um, you know, it, uh, sorry, I'm getting, I'm getting the poll too. Yeah. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna weigh in, I'll let other people decide. Um, you know, like that only just, that just came down last year, right? It's so like, there's so much work for us to do here. And this is a way that I think the memorialization actually in Germany can really be quite helpful for us. You know, that's interesting that you say that, but it would have to, it would require a complete change of ideology yeah. in the United States for yeah. the way that we have viewed um, the, the whole post-Civil War yeah. every moment since yeah. and up until this point. Yes, but we know that radical change is a slow process, right? <laughs> and so we, again, we just keep pushing and pushing. And you know, the, the, the statue came down. We're not going to let it get back up, right? So, but Barry, so yeah. Isabel Wilkerson talks about the home yeah. and, and the old home that you buy the home. And no matter what kind of um, condition it is, even if you weren't responsible for the condition, you still have, you're still in charge of the upkeep. And yeah. she uses that as a metaphor in, in talking about people who will say, uh, you know, I may be white, but I didn't, I didn't personally own slaves or, you know, the, the lack of responsibility given to um, the, the Brahmins in the United States yep. society, not using race, right? So um, she talks about that yeah. and, and one of the things I, I, I could kind of get with that because I always tell my students that race, I say race, is the foundation for which our house is built. And so I, I find it difficult. And maybe you can, you know, you can help in this discussion. I find it difficult to, to if I view it as a, a foundation, not just the bones and the structure of the house. Yeah. yeah. The foundation how do you get rid of it and and even if it is you know like when you have a, a basement problem you know and you got these termites or water and and your house begins to sink what does this mean i think we're in that space yeah well you know to, to roll that metaphor a bit you know <laughs> uh my partner uh who's also a faculty member here is a political theorist in the english department like we bought a house um in town in 2017 like you know we had to redo part of the foundation, you know, mm -hmm. much to our surprise soon after me, that's like that work can be done, right? That work can be done. But what it recognizes, I think, certainly on the part of Americans who believe themselves and who are treated as white is having a real hard critical look at the, the privilege that comes with that. Mm -hmm. And be thinking about what are the sacrifices? What are the changes? You know, and that's become really clear in this pandemic, right? On the one hand, we know that the, the, the disease, it affects all bodies sort of without regard to race sort of equally, but the experience of the treatment, experience of the accessibility to medicine, the, the, the uh, experience of who gets exposed to it and who doesn't, like mm -hmm. that's completely just riven through the, this, the, the experience of caste or the experience of race in America, right? Mm -hmm. And so those inequities have became so clear when all of the people who prop up the society, right? So it's, you know, the, the healthcare workers and the food service workers and uh, the people who do cleaning, the people who, who educate and take care of, of our children, these are the people who are getting sick the worst and the, the fastest and the most. Right? The essential workers. The essential workers, like the true essential workers, not the liquor store down the street, right? <laughs> um, like these are the people who are, who are, are being denied health care, right? Mm -hmm. they're, they're being told that they're actually the, the problem. You know, they're, they're being told that it's the, some fundamental weakness on their part, right? And this is where we need to have this real, real, you know, keep insisting on this hard, hard critical look, both me, myself, Barry Trachtenberg, but also, you know, the larger society that I'm a part of. 
I, I think that is a great place to stop. We are, we are just about at the point where we could talk about whiteness and the possessive investment in whiteness and identity politics and all of that. We're, we're right there. Um, um, but Rais has got to be amazing to talk about this at the next session too. So yeah. listen, I am so yeah. thankful for you, Rais, Armando and Anjan, all of you. Um, this has been so wonderful. Thank you, Muse Winston-Salem for giving us this opportunity. I hope you all enjoyed it. Thank you very much for attending and good night. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Good night. Thanks everybody.